Friends Church in Yorba Linda, California has a weekly attendance of 4,000 people, making it the largest Quaker or Society of Friends Church in the world. But in the United States, most Quaker congregations don't look like this church. Most Quaker congregations don't baptize, but this one does. Many Quaker congregations today are quite theologically liberal, but this one says that the Bible is without error. Friends Church is an Evangelical Friends congregation. They're part of Friends Southwest, a denomination of Evangelical Friends congregations in areas Arizona, California, and Nevada that is affiliated with Evangelical Friends Church International. EFC is just one part of the American Quaker landscape. According to Evangelical Friends Church Northwest, here's how that landscape looks today. Friends United Meeting now includes 13 yearly meetings in the Americas and 16 Friends groups in Africa. In North America, FUM membership numbers around 45,000, encompassing a broadly orthodox range of theology. Friends General Conference, generally liberal in theology, represents around 35,000 members, mostly in the United States. Five FGC yearly meetings share joint membership with FUM. Conservative Friends represent around 1,500 adherents, mostly North American, following a Christ centered, non pastoral, and plain tradition. Evangelical Friends Church International North America, pervasively evangelical and biblically based, has around 40,000 members. Still, other yearly meetings in North America remain unaffiliated, and most of these are unprogrammed and liberal. Approximately 29.4% of Friends in North America are part of the EFC International. Within the Evangelical Friends Church International in North America, there are six yearly meetings, each which operates independently. These are the Alaska Yearly Meeting, Evangelical Friends Church Eastern Region, Evangelical Friends Church Mid-America Yearly Meeting, Northwest Yearly Meeting, Rocky Mountain Yearly Meeting, and Friends Church Southwest. Each of these has their own history, and some groups are more traditional than others. For example, the Ohio Yearly Meeting was on its own for over 150 years before it joined the Evangelical Friends Alliance in 1965. The Ohio Yearly Meeting became the eastern region of the denomination, and Evangelical Friends Alliance renamed to Evangelical Friends International in 1990. Each of the regions has their own faith and practice document. They do borrow from each other and have similarities, so though I may quote from one or another faith or practice, realize that a similar statement may often be in the others as well. We will be focusing on the North America regions, though most of what is true about them will hold true in other regions outside of the U.S. as well. On the differences, the Southwest Yearly Meeting says, Friends history shows that each yearly meeting held final authority, making it almost a separate denomination. Larger groupings of yearly meetings provided shared ministries, but each had its own faith and practice, including its own statement of faith. For some years, most shared the Richmond Declaration of Faith, but in time, each developed its own and made various revisions. While the Evangelical Friends movement has much in common, some differences in polity and a few minor variations in doctrine do exist among yearly meetings. The EFCI Statement of Faith says on liberty. Regarding Christian liberty, we recognize that among Evangelical Friends and among among the larger body of evangelical Christians, there are minor differences of faith and practice due in part to historical and cultural differences and our imperfections. We look forward to the time when we shall all come into a greater unity of the faith. Until then, we believe that in biblical essentials there must be unity, in non-essentials there must be liberty, but in all things there must be charity. Now let's look at their theology. One God in three persons is affirmed, that is the Trinity. Jesus was born of a virgin, is both God and man. He was crucified as an atonement for the sins of the whole world. He arose, ascended, currently intercedes, and will return. There is a final judgment, and some will have everlasting glory in heaven, and others everlasting condemnation in hell. What about sacraments or ordinances? The statement of faith says, we believe that both Christian baptism and communion are spiritual realities which are not dependent upon physical and outward ordinances. That baptism is an inward receiving of the Holy Spirit in which he becomes Lord over all, guiding, cleansing, empowering, and in general representing God to us in immediate experience. That communion is the daily receiving and realization of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That this communion is dependent not only upon the condition of the believer walking daily in the light of Christ, but also in the historic act of Christ on Calvary, as his body was broken and blood shed once and for all for us. That Christ thus becomes a daily personal spiritual reality known immediately in Christian experience, and that through him and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God and divine realities are known experientially and immediately. 
The different regions each have explanations about ordinances or sacraments. The Eastern region, for example, says, Evangelical friends concerned with the abuses which had grown up about the serving of communion and the use of water in Christian baptism, and which substituted the outward for the inner spiritual reality, an abuse which persists to this day, place their emphasis upon the spiritual content and let the outward symbols fall into disuse. However, in 1886, Ohio Yearly Meeting, EFCER, felt constrained to grant liberty concerning the use or non-use of the outward elements of bread and wine in communion, as well as of water in Christian baptism, cautioning against any failure to achieve real spiritual sharing in the death of Christ and in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Each of our congregations may arrange services, perhaps in special meetings rather than in the regular worship service, for baptism and communion upon the request of members, while treating tenderly the consciences of those who protest the use of outward symbols. If a pastor feels a conviction against administering the ordinances, these services of another pastor may be enlisted in the observance. In all such services, it should be abundantly clear to the entire congregation that friends have the right to abstain from as well as to participate in the observance. In these services, it should also be clear that the observances are only symbols of an inward spiritual experience. Evangelical friends caution against the too frequent use of the symbols, lest familiarity breed contempt and diminish their spiritual significance. Friends Southwest clarifies, Friends Church Southwest Yearly Meeting permits the provision of water baptism and communion with the elements by our churches. This permission does not require any of our churches to provide them, nor does it constitute a recommendation to do so. We believe the best policy will be one that strongly upholds the truth that these ceremonies form no essential part of Christian worship and that the reality to which they point is immeasurably more satisfying. Dr. Thomas Crawford, an Evangelical Friends pastor of over 30 years and the executive director of the Eastern Region, conducted a survey of Evangelical Friends pastors in his doctoral dissertation for Liberty University in 2012. The survey had 86 pastors, 50 from the Eastern Region, 24 from Mid-America, and 9 from Southwest. One question he asked was, does your church regularly practice water baptism? The answers were 56.8% saying yes in public services, 13.6% saying yes in private services, and 29.6% saying no. 636 of those in the Mid-America region answered no, indicating that the practice is somewhat correlated to region. Baptism is not necessary for salvation, and no mode is prescribed if it is practiced. Dr. Crawford's survey showed 86.4% of the churches surveyed practiced the Lord's Supper, and 13.6% do not. As for a view of the presence of Christ in the elements, it must be said that on a scale from transubstantiation to symbolic, the Quaker view is even further to where the elements are unnecessary, but they do believe Christ is present in communion, just not with the need for elements. The physical elements are unnecessary. The communion with Christ takes place without them. When communion is practiced, it is open communion. The Bible is taught as a 66-book canon, given by inspiration. It is fully sufficient to make one wise unto salvation, and any professed guidance that is contrary to it must be counted a delusion. Until 1994, the denomination published Evangelical Friend magazine. In the September 1983 edition, two articles were published on the topic of creation and creationism. One was by Dale Thompson, a PhD biology professor, and the other by Donald Chittick, who held a PhD in physical chemistry. Thompson laid out the view of what he called fiat creation, the creation of everything from nothing in six solar days in the recent past, and was critical of those who said it was the only orthodox position. He also said, Scripture appears to be rather clear concerning several points, but even in these there is some room for disagreement. Beyond them there is little, if any, room for dogmatism. He states these clear points as, first, God created. The stuff of which the universe is composed is not eternal. What was its origin? Is it not reasonable to assume that God is its originator? The Christian opts for a theistic framework. Secondly, God created in succession. There is succession in geological phenomena. There is succession in scriptural pronouncements. Whether one holds to fiat, literal, solar day creation, progressive creation, or theistic evolution, succession and progression are obvious. The least would be six successive acts of creation. The greatest cannot be determined exactly. His third point is God created kinds. 
The kind of genesis is at best ambiguous. To equate it with species exclusively is not justifiable. Even though the taxonomic equivalent to the kind of scripture may be difficult to determine, the principle is clear. It would appear that at least archetypes were created by God, and within these archetypes a great deal of variation, or evolution if you will, has occurred. In other words, barriers to variation do exist. This is the precise point that separates the theistic evolutionists from the generally recognized creationists. Fourth, Thompson writes, is God created man as a unique being. Of no other living creature but man is it stated in scripture that it was made in the image of God. Part of what Chittick wrote in his article was creation and evolution are philosophies in conflict. They are two completely different worldviews. If one is true, the other is false. There must be conflict between these two views. Today, other than affirming that God is the creator, there is not much in the way of specifics in any of the faith and practice documents of the Evangelical Friends Church. Views on how God created, such as whether evolution was involved, may vary. Humanity is created in the image of God, fell by an act of transgression, suffered spiritual death, and is born in this disposition to sin. The Eastern Region says, While we hold these views of the lost condition of man in the fall, we rejoice to believe that sin is not imputed to any until they transgress the divine law, after sufficient capacity has been given to understand it. And the infants, though inheriting this fallen nature, are saved in the infinite mercy of God through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. On salvation, the EFCI Statement of Faith says, We believe that all those persons who repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior are born again into his kingdom by the Holy Spirit, and that these constitute the church universal of Jesus Christ. And also, we believe that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the direct and immediate agency of the Holy Spirit, people can be recovered from their fallen state through divine enlightenment, forgiveness of sin, regeneration and sanctification of their affection, and the final glorification of their bodies, that in this life they can love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, that they can live in victory over known sin and enjoy unbroken fellowship with the Heavenly Father, and that once more their whole lives may center in and revolve around their Creator and Redeemer. The faith and practice of the Northwest region says, The sinful condition of man, his proneness to yield to temptation, the world's absolute need of a Savior, and the cleansing from sin in the work of forgiveness and sanctification through the blood of Jesus are clearly set forth in the gospel of salvation. The possession of spiritual life is thus assured through a personal faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior, who through his love and sacrifice draws us to him. The vital principle of the Christian faith is the truth that our salvation and higher life are personal matters between the individual soul and God. The teachings of Jesus Christ concerning the spiritual nature of religion, the impossibility of promoting the spiritual life by the ceremonial application of material things, the fact that faith in Jesus Christ himself is all sufficient, and his presence in the believer's heart, these virtually destroy every priestly system and point the soul to the only satisfying source of spiritual life and power. In Dr. Crawford's survey, in answer to the question, Does your church teach that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ the Messiah? 100% of respondents answered yes. Of eternal security, the faith and practice of the Eastern region says, Security of the believer. Evangelical friends believe that the security of the believer, even for eternity, is indicated in God's word and witnessed to by the Holy Spirit to the individual, but we do not hold this security to be unconditional. As repentance and faith are the human conditions of acceptance of God's free offer of salvation, so faith manifested by obedience is necessary to continuance in that salvation. In Dr. Crawford's survey, respondents were asked to state whether their position on the security of the believer was more in line with the Wesleyan position or the Calvinist position. 71.4% said Wesleyan, and 28.6% said Calvinist. On sanctification, the EFCI Statement of Faith says, We believe the experience of sanctification is the work of God's grace by which affections are purified and exalted to a supreme love to God and others, and the believer is empowered to witness of the living Christ. This is accomplished by the filling of the Holy Spirit in the life of a dedicated and believing child of God, that this is both an act in which the heart is purified by faith and a process in which the life is continuously disciplined into paths of holiness. By submission and availability to Jesus Christ, people become channels for Christ to do his work in this present age. A previous version of the Statement of Faith read slightly differently, which seems closer to wording of entire sanctification. Instead of filling with the Holy Spirit, it was baptism with the Holy Spirit, and instead of the heart is purified by faith, it is stated the heart is cleansed from an imperfect relationship and state. Only the Eastern region's faith and practice uses the term entire sanctification. They say, 
Evangelical friends believe in the biblical teaching of entire sanctification as a second work of grace. This is the position of George Fox, Robert Barclay, and Joseph John Gurney. The emphasis on the Holy Spirit, always characteristic of friends, made the Wesleyan Arminian teaching on holiness congenial to these friends also. The baptism with the fullness of the Holy Spirit is the way God cleanses from the sinful nature and makes believers holy. George Fox said, And Christ did baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire, and did thoroughly purge his floor and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Holiness is deliverance from the pollution, nature, and love of sin. The experience is called perfect love. On spiritual gifts, the EFCI Statement of Faith says, We believe that in the fellowship of his body, the Holy Spirit gives to every member a gift to be exercised for the mutual advantage of every member in the body and for the influence of the church upon those outside. The ministry is a special calling given to certain ones whom God ordains for a service of leadership in his church, that this service may be that of pastoring, teaching, evangelizing, administration, or other kinds of service to humanity. The Eastern region's faith and practice says the following of speaking in tongues. While there are differences of interpretation among our members of the scriptures which speak of glossolalia, as there are among other Christians, both as to whether the term refers to actual languages or to ecstatic utterances, and as to whether this is a valid gift for our time, we are nevertheless agreed. Speaking in tongues should not be regarded as a necessary sign of the fullness or baptism with the Spirit. Speaking in tongues should not be made an occasion of division or strife among us. We must be willing to voluntarily give up certain freedoms in order to avoid becoming a stumbling block to those for whom Christ died. The Southwest region's faith and practice says, We affirm with the scriptures that not every gift has usefulness in every situation, and that some gifts, such as tongues and prophecy, have biblical guidelines on their use in public worship. We do not, however, find any biblical assertion that these gifts have ceased, and we want to be careful not to place any non-biblical boundaries on their use. Dr. Crawford's survey asked, Do you permit speaking in tongues? The responses were 42.3% never, 46.5% yes in small groups or home meetings, 11.3% yes in public worship. On eschatology, there is no required viewpoint. EFC Southwest says, We refuse to divide fellowship over disputed questions of eschatology that are not clear in the scriptures. The Evangelical Friends Church Statement of Faith says that marriage is between a biologically born male and a biologically born female, and that it is lifelong and sexually exclusive. On divorce, the Northwest Yearly Meetings Faith and Practice says marriage is for life and ought not to be broken by divorce except on scriptural grounds. In all cases, serious attempts should be made for forgiveness and for reconciliation. Where divorce has occurred, it is the responsibility of friends to demonstrate the love of God so that the divorced person may live purposefully within the Christian fellowship. Whether the person remains single or remarries, the church is to show love. If a remarriage occurs, the church is to encourage the new marriage relationship to be centered in Christ love. Persons who have been divorced but are living consistent Christian lives should not be hindered from joining the church or working in it. Evangelical friends voice opposition to abortion. The Mid-America Faith and Practice says, Friends believe that all life is a gift of God, Genesis 2-7, Job 33-4. We hold that abortion on demand or for reasons of personal convenience, social adjustment, or economic advantage is morally wrong. Friends believe an appropriate and morally acceptable alternative to abortion is to arrange for immediate adoption upon birth. They believe that married couples have the right to exercise their preferences as to means of preventing or avoiding conception. Evangelical Friends Church services are mostly programmed worship, in contrast to some other Friends denominations. The Mid-America region says worship may be silent or vocal, taking various forms. It does not depend on certain ceremonies or traditions. Worship is a natural outgrowth of union with Christ and should be directed by a spirit. The service of worship will usually include times of prayer, praise, and preaching. During public worship services, we should also allow sufficient time for reflection, meditation, and decision. Services are generally not completely operated in the silent style, but there might be times of silence incorporated into the worship. Rocky Mountain Yearly Meeting says, During open worship time, each worshiper is encouraged to wait patiently and quietly before the Lord. In doing this, we become a corporate body listening to its head. Wait upon the Lord by listening for God's voice within your heart. Seek to be quiet, surrendered, and attentive to God. Then permit your heart to be led in whatever way the Spirit directs you. Vocal ministry that is helpful. Spontaneous words of joy, praise, thanksgiving, and adoration to the Lord. 
simple words of witness or testimony, sharing the workings of the Spirit in your own life or the congregation's life. Honest confession of sin can have a humbling and healing effect on the whole congregation. Words of encouragement, speaking perhaps from some scripture passage or personal concern, prophetically declaring God's specific message for his people. Prayer that arises out of the needs and wants of the worshiping community. This is a prayer for the body. A passage of scripture selected on an inner impression from the Spirit and read clearly and effectively. A hymn or song appropriate for the moment. It can be sung either by an individual or by the whole congregation. Music style varies from church to church, with some using traditional hymns, others contemporary praise music, and often a mixture. The Rocky Mountain region's faith and practice says, Scripture calls the body the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, friends encourage believers to dedicate their bodies to wholesome practices, rather than to evil or unwholesome activities. Following are examples of wholesome practices. One listed is use medicines carefully, following the physician's instructions, refrain from the use of alcoholic beverages, habit-forming drugs, and tobacco. Dr. Crawford's survey asked, is it always wrong for a pastor to drink alcohol or use tobacco? 46.1% said yes, and 53.9% specified there are acceptable circumstances. In written answers to the survey, many pastors indicated that drunkenness is a sin, but consumption in moderation is not, and that one should be careful not to stumble other believers. The Rocky Mountain region's faith and practice says, friends are urged to refrain from gambling, which includes lotteries. Consider the financial needs of the ministries of the local church in the yearly meeting, as well as worthy parachurch organizations in the practice of stewardship, which includes tithes, offerings, wills, and estates. 91% of respondents on Dr. Crawford's survey said that tithing is taught, mentioned, or carried out occasionally or frequently in their church. On war, the Rocky Mountain region's faith and practice says, The teachings of Jesus, the whole spirit of his gospel, and the provisions of his grace call men and women to live at peace with one another. Life is sacred. Therefore, war and violence are not consistent with the practice of Christian holiness to which believers are called by Christ. Members are encouraged to find nonviolent methods for achieving civil justice and the reparation of wrongs. Similarly, the Mid-America region says, Peace and war. Friends feel that life is sacred and that war and violence are not consistent with Christian principles. It is our firm conviction that war is wrong as a method of settling disputes, destructive of our highest values, and productive of the seeds of future wars. We, therefore, as a church, unequivocally support young friends who, as conscientious objectors to war, refuse military service. And we are concerned to find alternative solutions based upon justice and righteousness for all peoples, and are deeply moved to participate in the new calls to peacemaking which are being sounded in our day. EFC Southwest says that it is good that Christians are getting involved in the political process and states, We believe that God does call individual believers to seek elected, appointed, and consultative positions in government. The Mid-America region's faith and practice says on oaths, Friends refrain from profanity of speech and from swearing to legal oaths. One should tell the truth whether under oath or not. On the church, the EFCI Statement of Faith says, We believe that wherever two or three are gathered together regularly and faithfully in the name of Christ, he is truly present in the person of the Holy Spirit, and that such an assembly is a local church, the visible expression of his body and the church universal. The Northwest region says, Friends' polity is connectional, rather than congregational or episcopal. Therefore, the yearly meeting represents the highest court of appeal in matters of faith and practice. The church does not make or appoint ministers. It only recognizes gifts where they exist and properly provides for their exercise and development as a sacred bestowal of the head of the church. Likewise, EFC Southwest says, Friends believe that only God ordains a minister. His people recognize God's ordination and record those called and gifted for public ministry. For legal purposes and tax requirements, the term recording is interchangeable with the term ordination. Churches have a pastor or pastors and a board or committee of local elders. As a whole, evangelical friends are in favor of women in ministry, though local churches are free to differ. The Mid-America region says, Christ-centered friends believe in the universal call to ministry that extends to all believers. In ministry leadership, friends recognize that both men and women are equal recipients of the divine call of God. As such, friends support a gender non-restricted leadership structure, affirming, not as a concession to modernity, but in obedience to the Bible and the Holy Spirit, that the Lord is calling both women and men to serve as leaders and pastors in his church. 
The Rocky Mountain region says God's ordination of women for public ministry has been recognized and recorded among friends since the 1600s. Women serve as pastors, missionaries, evangelists, teachers, speakers, and in various roles of leadership and responsibility. George Fox University, founded in 1885 as Friends Pacific Academy, is associated with the Northwest Yearly Meeting of Friends and is the largest private university in the state of Oregon, with 4,295 students in the 2021 through 2022 school year. Other schools also exist, like Barclay College in Kansas. The Evangelical Friends Church International is part of the National Association of Evangelicals. In the U.S., EFCI has around 40,000 adherents and roughly 300 congregations, and internationally, there are over 1,800 worship groups and 180,000 worshipers in 36 countries. 50 to 60,000 of those are in Africa. So let's end where we began, at Friends Church in Yorba Linda. Quakerism has been known for diversity, and even within the Evangelical Friends Church, there's room for it. Jennifer Buck in 2017 wrote in Quaker Religious Thought Journal that this church, in her opinion, shows overlap with neo-reformed theology. She says, In Friends Church Your Belinda, a megachurch of 5,000-plus members and a 100-year history, this manifests in conservative views of eschatology, regular practice of the sacraments, an elimination of women elders and preachers, and a more traditional conservative reading of scripture. They would understand such alignment of their theology with the neo-reform movement as a move for correct doctrine as well as growth emphasis, even though they would still understand themselves as non-confessional. Also, ironically, given my next example, they would reject the second blessing teaching regarding spiritual gifts and tongues, though this topic has been a cause for splits in their church in its past. From talking with some of its pastoral staff, as well as observing the manner in which it partners with the rest of our yearly meeting, I believe it would understand much of its Quaker identity as solely historical, with self-doctrines that have essentially become non-functioning beliefs. An odd reality from one of the largest Friends churches worldwide, but perhaps not related to size rarely equating to faithfulness in our movement. Perhaps Friends Church isn't the best example of a representative church within the denomination, although they may not agree with what Jennifer Buck says, but one thing can be seen from Buck's article, and that is that there is room in the EFCI for churches that don't toe the line on every point of doctrine. And what could be more Quaker than that?